Praise the Lord. Welcome back. We're going to start our second session here. It's so vital uh, that we do deal um, with these issues of reaching out to those who are in cults, are caught up in pseudo-Christian uh, activities. You know, the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. And it is an issue of the written scriptures when we're dealing with people. Every false error, every false gospel is going to be exposed by the, the simple teaching and proclamation of the Word of God. So we love the Word of God. We must know the Word of God. And if we're familiar with the scriptures, they'll lead us uh, through so much. We just appreciate Brother Cecil being with us here again. And uh, I do believe that these messages are falling on good ground. Uh, it is going to help us in reaching out to those, just like we heard of the two ladies on the street. Don't be scared to reach out and to tell them such a wonderful testimony of what Christ has done in our heart in the days ahead. So, Brother Cecil, I'm going to hand uh, straight back uh, over to you to continue with this uh, second session. God bless you. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Brother Keith, and uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us for this uh, teaching session, and I trust the Lord will use it and bless it. Uh, some years ago in Northern Ireland, they published a league table of all the religious groupings in Northern Ireland, and there was a total of 76 were listed actually in this uh, census, uh, and in number 17 was the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, the Mormons that we looked at earlier, they came in at number 20 in the league table. So it was the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and I'm sure you have maybe encountered these people. Maybe they've called at your door and they're trying to uh, encourage you to take these magazines, the Awake or the Watchtower. Or in more recent years, they've actually become much more public. Uh, they have set up uh, little display stalls with their magazines maybe at railway stations or marketplaces or that. And uh, they don't really say too much. They just stand there and uh, you're welcome to take. And obviously, if you do speak to them, they will engage with you. Uh, but they are certainly very active uh, promoting their religion. So wh where do they get their title from? Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. The, the organization is known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society based in Brooklyn in New York. But where did they get the title from? Well, in Isaiah 43, verse 10, we read this. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. So the witnesses appropriate that as applying to them. Uh, they also take Matthew chapter 24, verse 45, as applying to them, where we read, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. And again, the Watchtower believed that this uh, applies to their organization back in 1954 in their Watchtower magazine. They wrote, today the facts of the past few decades show Jehovah has been and is using the Watchtower Society and Jehovah's Witnesses as a teaching organization, anointed witnesses who make up the promised faithful and discreet slave appointed to give spiritual food at the proper time. That was 1954, and they repeated it again uh, some years later in another of their magazines in 1991. What can I tell you about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, I want to really look at, first of all, the inception, then the deception, and then thirdly, the reception. So what is the uh, inception? Well, again, I'll mention briefly two of the leading figures right at the outset. Uh, the founder was a man called Charles Tails Russell. He was born in Pennsylvania in uh, February of 1852. His parents could have been congregational, church-going people, uh, but he himself, as a young man, came under the influence of Seventh-day Adventist preachers. And uh, there was one particular doctrine that he warmed to, if I could use that expression, and that was the teaching that there is no such a place as hell where people will suffer eternal conscious punishment. In 1879, he published Zion's Watchtower, which was the forerunner of the Watchtower magazine that witnesses offer to you today. 
Uh, he was very much into biblical prophecy and he sought to uh, set out a timeline of uh, how he thought things would unfold in the future. Uh, he wrote a series of books called Studies in the Scriptures and he clearly had a very high opinion of these books. Uh, he said this, uh, not only do we find that people cannot see the divine plan in studying the Bible by itself, if anyone lays the scripture studies aside, in other words, his books, and ignores them and goes to the Bible alone, our experience shows that within two years he goes into darkness. On the other hand, if he had merely read the scripture studies and had not read a page of the Bible as such, he would be in the light at the end of two years. So he had a very high opinion of his own writings that they would bring light into someone rather than them just reading the Bible alone. Uh, he wrote, as I say, a number of volumes. And in those volumes, he predicted certain things would happen at a certain time. And when those things didn't happen at the at time that he had uh, prophesied, well, when the books were reprinted, he simply changed the date. He did actually acknowledge in one of the reprints that he had got it wrong in the first uh, edition. And this is what he wrote. The thought that the church would all be gathered to glory before October 1914 certainly did have a stimulating effect upon thousands, all of whom accordingly can praise the Lord even for the mistake. So even though he made a prophetic utterance, which didn't happen, he said, what a wonderful the effect that it had, and we should praise God for that. Uh, I can't somehow imagine Isaiah writing something like that. You know, if he had prophesied something that didn't happen, he says, well, it sure wasn't it great. We had a great time, even though it didn't happen. The word of God in Deuteronomy 18.22 makes it plain that if someone claims to prophesy and it doesn't happen, then they are a false prophet. Uh, he was a man of dubious character. Uh, he did a little bit of tent making to raise money. He sold wheat and he called it miracle wheat. He claimed that it grew five times faster than other people's wheat. It was tested in court and found to be of inferior quality. So as I say, uh, he wasn't a, a very uh, reliable person. Uh, also in another court case, he claimed that he could read Greek so they said Greek in front of him and he couldn't read it. Uh, eventually his wife divorced him in 1916 for various uh, reasons and he died shortly after that. Uh, he was then succeeded by a man called Joseph Franklin Rutherford who was known as Judge Rutherford. Uh, he wasn't a judge actually, he was a Missouri lawyer, uh, but he continued to publish uh, Russell's writings uh, amending and adapting and changing to cover up any prophetic mistakes and so on. Uh, he too got into the prophetic business. Uh, he wrote a book called Millions Now Living Will Never Die and uh, it predicted that 1925 would be a tremendous year, a year of resurrection of Old Testament saints and so on and uh, of course it didn't happen. In fact, an earlier book that I will be quoting from is called The Heart of God, proof conclusive that millions now living will never die. And it was published in 1921. And of course, 1925 was supposed to be the year when all of these things would happen and all these millions would not die and nothing happened. And the result is that that generation predominantly, if not totally, has died out. So again, he was a false prophet. Uh, during that time in the 1920s, uh, he was so sure that these Old Testament saints and the heroes of Hebrews 11 uh, would be resurrected uh, that uh, as head of the organization, he arranged for it to buy a mansion in San Diego called Beth Sarim, which is the house of the princes. And it was written into the deeds that this was for these Old Testament heroes. Uh, this is what part of the deed says. Any other person or persons connected with the said Watchtower Bible and Tract Society shall have the right to reside on said premises until the appearing of David or some of the other men mentioned in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Any person appearing to take possession of said premises shall first prove and identify themselves to the proper officers of the said society 
as the person or persons described in Hebrews chapter 11. So I'm not quite sure if he was expecting Abraham to come knocking at the door and say, I'm Abraham, I'm here to occupy this mansion. And they were then going to say, well, you have to prove your identity. Do, do you have your driving license or something like that? I mean, it was utterly ridiculous. Of course, these people were not resurrected. And in depression hit America, it provided for officers of the society that they could use it. And so Joseph Franklin Rutherford did use it during uh, the 1930s time of depression. So the founders of this organization were false prophets who predicted things that didn't happen whatsoever. And these are the people uh, that these today the followers have to kind of look up to uh, and think about. Uh, Rutherford was eventually succeeded by a man called Nathan Knorr, uh, his surname spelled as in the soup, K-N-O-R-R. -R. And the one thing that he is really famous for is he oversaw the production of their own translation of the Bible. It's called the New World Translation of the Bible. But we're going to see as we work through this that it is a very corrupt uh, edition of the Bible, not a reliable one uh, in any shape or form. So those, uh, that's very much the uh, inception of the uh, organization. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned about the uh, uh, features of a cult, as well as the earthly head or founders, you have authority in addition to or in place of the Bible. Well, I have already uh, mentioned the uh, fact that brother or Russell believed that his own uh, writings uh, were superior in many ways to uh, the uh, Bible itself and uh, they do believe that their magazines are direct teachings from God. Uh, there was a famous court case in 1943 a then vice president of the organization called Frederick Franz uh, he was asked in a court case, Jehovah God is now the editor of the paper. Is that right? Question mark. Answer, he is today the editor of the paper. Question, how long has he been editor of the paper? Answer, since its inception, he has been guiding it. And then in the same court case, I mentioned President Nathan Knorr. Uh, he was asked about the importance of the Watchtower magazine. Question. In fact, it is set forth directly as God's word, isn't it? Question mark. Answer. Yes, as his word. Question. Without any qualification whatsoever? Question mark. Answer. That is right. So the Bible alone is not the only authority where this organization is concerned. They also believe that the writings of their organization are on a par or even superior to the Bible. So earthly header finder, another authority. Then what about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is the Christ of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, the first heading I would give you is a created Christ. Uh, and this is where I want to turn to uh, their Bible, their New World Translation. And I want to show you how they have mistranslated uh, some of the scriptures to prove that Christ was created. They believe that Christ was the first thing created by Jehovah God, the Father who alone is God. And they do believe actually that Christ in his pre-existence was Michael the Archangel. But in Colossians chapter 1, this is how they translate verses 16 onwards. Because by means of him, that is Christ, all other things were created in the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, no matter whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Maybe notice that I emphasize the word other. Because in their Bible, it's actually in brackets. And what does that mean? Well, it's an acknowledgement that the word other is not in the original text. Uh, in the authorized version of the Bible, you sometimes get words that are in italics. 
And that's there to show that those have been added by the translators to help the flow of the verse. Well, the witnesses say, well, we have uh, inserted the word other there to clarify the verse's concern and to clarify the meaning. But they haven't clarified the meaning. They have changed the meaning. Because if Christ created all things, it means that he himself was not created. But by adding all other things, it makes room for their teaching that he himself was first created by the Father and then created all other things. So uh, that's uh, what they, how they mangled those verses. Also in the verse beforehand, in verse 15 of Colossians 1, it refers to the firstborn of all creation. And they say, there you are, the firstborn, that means the first thing created. But the Greek word used does not mean first created. It refers to rank. It refers to preeminence. It means that Christ is the heir of all things created. It does not mean that he himself was created. <clears throat> In Revelation 3 verse 14, uh, Christ refers to himself as the beginning of the creation of God. The New World Translation renders that the beginning of the creation by God. That is not a correct translation of the Greek. And the beginning is the Greek word arche, from which we would get our word architect. And so Christ is the architect of creation, but he's not part of the creation. So they talk about uh, Christ being created uh, and uh, it, uh, they mangle the scriptures uh, to do that. Uh, I mentioned that they believe that in his pre-existence he was Michael the Archangel. They believe it was Michael the Archangel who then came to earth at the incarnation as a perfect man, but only a man. Uh, they then teach that he became the Christ uh, at his baptism. But even their own Bible uh, records the words of the angels to the shepherds, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. The Lord was always the Christ from his incarnation here on earth. It didn't happen at his baptism. But as I say, they, they believe that he was Michael the archangel. And they believed that he was unique. But yet in Daniel 10, and verse 13, uh, it refers to Michael, one of the foremost princes. So if he's one of the foremost princes, then there must have been others on a similar rank to him. Uh, also, of course, in Jude verse 9, uh, there's reference to what happened to the body uh, of Moses after he died. Uh, and we read that uh, Michael the archangel did not dare to bring a judgment against him. This is the devil who he's having a dispute with. Uh, but of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, he had many encounters and disputes uh, with the devil. So there is not one verse of scripture that would actually suggest that uh, Jesus was Michael the archangel. So as I say, they uh, believe uh, that he was, the Lord Jesus Christ was created. They believed too that he was uh, uh, Michael, uh, the archangel, not proved from scripture. What about uh, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, of course, they utterly uh, deny this. Uh, they uh, mangle John 1 and verse 1. Uh, you know the verse, I'm sure, very well. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But in the New World Translation, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, small g. Well, why do they translate it that way? Well, they say, well, it's due to the Greek. Uh, when he uh, was with God, capital G, there is a definite article before the word used for God. Uh, but when it says, and the word was a God according to them, there's no definite article. So if there's a definite article, then God has a capital G. If there's no definite article, then it's a God, small g. 
in the introduction to their Bible, they say they will be consistent in the way they translate things. Well, applying that in John chapter 13 uh, and verse 3, uh, we find that they do not follow their own uh, rules of application because the Lord talks about he came from God and is going to God. And in one instance, there is a definite article before the word God. And in the other instance, there's no definite article. But the witnesses translate both of those in John 13, 3 with a capital G. The only reason they mangle verse 1 of John 1 is to teach their false belief that Jesus was not God in the flesh. But, you know, uh, Paul, when he's writing to the Philippians uh, in chapter 2, uh, in their uh, own translation, we read this, keep this mental attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he was existing in God's form, well, if he pre-existed in God's form, that means he was God. What about worship? The Bible makes it plain that only God should be worshiped. Uh, and there's an incident uh, in John chapter nine, uh, where a man said, uh, that he, he worshipped God. Uh, we read it in verse 38. But what do the witnesses say in their translation? He, this is the blind man born since death, said, I do put faith in him, Lord, and he did obeisance to him. Well, why did they come up with did obeisance? Because they didn't want to use the correct translation, which is that he worshipped him. So, as I say, the New World Translation is a very corrupt uh, version and uh, it clearly teaches the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure one of the best examples was a post-resurrection appearance. You remember how the Lord had appeared to the disciples and Thomas, of course, was not present at that time. And he says, unless I see the nail prints and so on, I will not believe. And so in John, 20 and verse 28 uh, the Lord has reappeared and Thomas uh, acknowledges him by saying my Lord and my God literally the Lord of me the God of me so Thomas testified to the fact that he uh, was uh, in fact deity manifest in the flesh there's other scriptures from the book of Revelation in the opening chapter, Christ referred to himself as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And then in later chapters in the book of Revelation, uh, we read that God refers to himself in such terminology. So it is clear, and in the handout that I'll give you tomorrow, there will be a fuller explanation of those uh, teachings uh, from the book of Revelation. So Jesus, according to them, pre-existed as Michael the Archangel, and then he came to earth as a man, but only a man. In fact, uh, they published a book a few years ago called The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived. Uh, so they believe that this man, he died. They believe that he died on an upright torture stake. They, they don't acknowledge that it was a cross because in their thinking, the cross is a, a symbol of paganism. Uh, and so they say Christ was uh, sort of on an upright torture stake and that's how he died. Well, to be quite truthful, I wouldn't argue the point too much with them because it's important that Christ died on a tree because the Bible tells us that cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree and Christ bore the curse of the broken law the law that you and I have broken. Uh, he bore the curse so that we would be freed from the curse of the broken law. Uh, so as I say, but they believe that after he died, he was buried and they don't know what happened to his body. They don't know it was stolen and spirited away or whether it decomposed. But they believe that he was uh, recreated a mighty spirit creature uh, once again, and that is their uh, understanding uh, from that. Uh, let me uh, give you uh, a quote from 
uh, one of their books. Uh, this is called Let God Be True. Uh, and it says this on page uh, 122. So the King Christ Jesus was put to death in the flesh and was resurrected an invisible spirit creature. Therefore, the world will see him no more. Well, in other words, they don't believe in a bodily resurrection. Well, then how do they explain the post-resurrection experiences of the Lord recorded in the Bible? Well, they said that he basically took on the appearance of having been physically resurrected to encourage the disciples. Well, if that was the case, then the Lord would be guilty of being uh, a deception, you know, guilty of deception. Uh, so uh, that's one way. But the truth of the matter is that the Lord was erected and he wasn't just a spirit creature. Uh, he appeared to the disciples and he says, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And also there was the incident uh, with Thomas uh, where he appeared and said, put your hands and fingers into the crucifixion marks, if you like. And of course, in John chapter 2, the Lord predicted that he would be physically resurrected. He was in the temple, and he said, destroy this temple, and three days I will raise it up again. And of course, the, the listeners thought, he's talking about this huge temple that we've spent decades trying to build, literally. But then it adds, but this speak he of the body, uh, the temple of his body and the disciples understood after he had been resurrected. So this idea that the man, Jesus, uh, is gone forever, it, it is just uh, not true in any shape or form at all. Um, they have a great uh, description of how the Lord ascended after his resurrection. And it's from this book, uh, the greatest man who ever lived. They say, later Jesus meets again with his apostles and leads them out of the city as far as Bethany, which is located on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. While they are still looking on, Jesus begins rising heavenward, and then a cloud obscures him from their sight. After dematerializing his fleshly body, he ascends to heaven as a spirit person. Sounds a bit like something out of Star Trek. So they believe he's a spirit creature and that he will never be seen visibly again. And this is because they deny the bodily resurrection of the Lord. The bodily resurrection is an essential ingredient of the gospel. First four verses of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul declares unto the gospel of which you're saved, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that involves the physical resurrection. And Paul goes on later uh, in that chapter uh, to explain how vital the resurrection is in verses 14 through to 17. He basically says, if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins. So this whole denial of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is very important. So as far as the person of Christ is concerned, they say he was a created archangel who then became a perfect man who now is once more a spirit creature. Now what about the uh, work of the Lord Jesus Christ? How do they view that? Well, this is where you'll get a wrong view of salvation. Uh, they believe that his work opened up the opportunity uh, for salvation. Uh, this book, The Harp of God, uh, that I showed earlier on, uh, this is what it says. Jesus, the perfect man, permitted his life to be taken that it might be used for the purpose of releasing Adam and his offspring from the great enemy death and that they might have a full opportunity for life. So the death of Christ has sort of uh, opened up an opportunity for life. And uh, what is this life that they are talking about? Well, it's a two-tier system. Uh, there is a sort of upper heavenly tier, and then there is a lower earthly tier. Uh, again, if I go to let God be true, uh, this is what uh, we find 
uh, in uh, their book. It says, all who by reason of faith in Jehovah God and in Christ Jesus consecrate themselves to do God's will and then faithfully carry out their consecration will be rewarded with everlasting life. However, that life will not be the same for all. The Bible clearly shows that some of these 144,000 will share heavenly glory with Christ Jesus, while others will enjoy the blessings of this life here on earth. So uh, you find that there is the heavenly tier, the upper tier, and that's for a select group of 144,000. And then everybody else hopes to have a blessed time down here on a revamped paradise earth. Uh, only the 144,000 are going to be ruling with Christ in heaven. Uh, and this is what it says further in this book. His time to give creatures on earth the opportunity to get in line for a heavenly ward has been from AD 29 until chiefly 1931. During this time, the heavenly hope was made known to all who consecrated themselves to God. But since flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, such consecrated ones would have to be brought forth as God's spiritual sons, begotten of his spirit to a heavenly hope before God could give them such a glorious reward. The witnesses teach that between the day of Pentecost, 29 AD, if you like, uh, until 1931, that's when the 144,000 were picked out for the heavenly hope. And it says they were begotten of his spirit to a heavenly hope. So they teach that only the 144,000 are those who are born again. Jesus is their mediator, but there are also lots of other mediators for the average person down here. And the 144,000 are actually the mediators for the people down here on earth. And uh, it says about the 144,000, being made kings and priests and by reason of the new covenant that he, that is Jesus, Jesus mediated, they, that's the 144,000, will share in administering the blessings of Jesus' sacrifice and of his kingdom rule to all the nations of the earth. So the average witness who comes to your door who's hoping to uh, live a good life that will entitle him to live forever on paradise earth, Christ is not their mediator. The 144,000 are his. These 144,000, uh, they are known as the anointed class. Now, why is it that they are the anointed class? Well, this brings us to the subject of being born again. Uh, and there is a book that the witnesses have called Reasoning from the Scriptures. There's a heading on that page, Born Again. This is what it says. Being born again involves being baptized in water and begotten by God's Spirit, born from the Spirit, thus becoming a son of God with the prospect of sharing in the kingdom of God. Jesus had this experience as to the 144,000 who are heirs with him of the heavenly kingdom. To suggest that Jesus had that experience, in other words, born again, quite frankly, is blasphemy. Because who needs to be born again? Those who are dead in trespasses and in sins. And the Lord Jesus Christ most certainly was not dead in trespasses and sins in sins. So, uh, as I say, uh, the witnesses have a false teaching on the 144,000. This actually brings me to uh, a witnessing tool that I would use quite regularly uh, with witnesses. And uh, as I say, the average witness who comes to your door, because the allocation was filled up in 1931, most of that generation, if not all of them, would now be dead. So these witnesses who come to your door would probably not claim to be born again. So when I've been talking to witnesses, again, you, you let them talk uh, and say their spiel. And then I would say, could I ask you a question? And they say, yeah, yeah, go ahead. 
I said, would you read to me John chapter three, verse six. And in that, you know, it's the conversation between the Lord and Nicodemus. And the Lord says to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So if they read it, I then say to them, would you agree with me? And when the Lord says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, is you and I, as we are here in our fleshly bodies. And they would say, yes, that's, that's right. And I say, and when the Lord says that which is born of the spirit, he's talking about someone having been born again because he's told Nicodemus he needs to be born again. And generally they would say, yes, that's right. Then I would say to them, I take it you don't claim to be born again. And they would say, no, they're being honest because only 144,000 are born again. So having said that, I would say to them then, tell me this, do you believe that you're pleasing God and do you claim to be a Christian? Now, in times past, witnesses in earlier years would not have claimed to be Christians, but now they do claim to be Christians. So as regards pleasing God, they would say, well, I hope so. And as regards a Christian, oh, yes. So I asked them, well, would you read Romans chapter 8, verses 8 and 9? And in those verses, it says several things. Uh, first of all, it says, so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And secondly, it says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I say, when you read those two verses, you don't claim to be born again. Therefore, according to the Bible, you don't belong to Christ. Therefore, you're not a Christian. And secondly, because you're not born again, you're only in the flesh, and they that are in the flesh, according to the Bible, cannot please God. And if they start to question the things, I said, well, look, your argument is not with me. It is actually with the word of God. So that is something that you might keep in mind if you are speaking to Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, a second thing then, just moving on, is uh, I mentioned this morning or earlier about uh, Charles Taylor Russell being influenced by Seventh-day Adventists and he liked their teaching that there was no hell. Well, not surprisingly, that is one of the beliefs uh, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not believe in eternal conscious punishment in hell. Uh, returning again to reasoning from the scriptures, uh, we find several references about the subject. Uh, it says, first of all, both in Christendom and in many non-Christian religions, it is taught that hell is a place inhabited by demons and where the wicked after death are punished. And some believe that this is with torment. Uh, and then they go on to say, the real roots of this god dishonoring doctrine go much deeper. The fiendish concepts associated with the hell of torment slander God and originate with the chief slanderer of God, the devil, which means slanderer, the one whom Jesus called the father of the lies. So they, they don't believe there's eternal conscious punishment for the wicked after death. Uh, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ made numerous references to uh, hell and where the worm dieth not and the, the fire is not quenched. Uh, there is certainly a place of eternal conscious punishment. One of the things that really challenged, uh, or at least a, a verse that I thought was a good challenge to uh, the witnesses on this subject of hell, uh, it relates to Judas. If you think about it, before Judas was born, he didn't exist. And then he was born and he lived his life and he was one of the disciples of the Lord who then betrayed him and he came to a very nasty end. Well, according to the witnesses, uh, Judas would, would end up just being annihilated. He would not exist. In other words, he would be in the same condition, if you like, before he was actually born. And yet what did the Lord say? 
about Judas. He said, woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would good for him if he had never been born. In other words, the Lord was saying that the eternal fate of Judas would be much worse than if he had never been born. Before he was born, he didn't exist. But now that he has died, his condition is worse than before he was born. So he must be existing somewhere in torments. And of course, in Acts 1, we're told that he went to his own appointed place. So, uh, as I say, there is definite teaching that there is eternal conscious punishment in a place called hell, even though it is denied by the witnesses. In let God be true, there is uh, other teaching uh, on this subject. It says this, the doctrine of a burning hell where the wicked are tortured eternally after death cannot be true mainly for four reasons. Because it's wholly unscriptural, because it's unreasonable, because it is contrary to God's love, and because it is repugnant to justice. I remember two Jehovah's Witness ladies coming to my door in Balnehench. They talked about a number of issues and they brought up this subject about hell and they said, I suppose you believe in the eternal conscious punishment. I said, yes, I do, because that's what the Bible teaches. And they said to me, but how could a loving father send any of his children to such a place? I said, well, unfortunately, you have a misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches about who are God's children. I said, yes, everyone uh, in a creative sense is the offspring of God. But in a familial sense, when we are born into this world, we are separated from the family of God because of our sin. And it is only when we are born again and saved that a wonderful transfer happens. And Paul tells us in several places in the New Testament that we are adopted into the family of God. I said, so those whom God sends to hell are not his children. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. This only applies to born again believers. To suggest that God would send some of his children to hell is not the true teaching of the scriptures. So, as I say, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they do try in many ways to package themselves uh, as Christians, but that is not the truth of their uh, beliefs. And all we're doing when we interact with Jehovah's Witnesses, in fact, with any of the religious cult members, as we're seeking to sow little seeds, little seeds that may be of doubt uh, in their mind. And we would hope that God by his spirit would in fact bring them to challenge uh, their understanding, to undermine their faith in the organization. Uh, in Ballon Hinch where I live, there's a, a man that I've met many, many times and uh, Margaret has met him too through walking dogs. Uh, they have a common interest in that. And this man, has been attending uh, the Kingdom Hall for 10 or more years, but he has never ever actually joined the organization. And from time to time, I would have shared some information with him and so on. And about six months ago, he came to me and he says, I'm finished with them. I'm not gonna be involved with them or attend their meetings anymore. And at this stage, it wasn't so much doctrine, but the Jehovah's Witnesses, like many other religious institutions, have been plagued with immorality in the ranks. Uh, leaders have been involved in misconduct and they have sought to cover it up.
but it's all coming out now. I, I think it's in the San Diego area in particular, it has surfaced. And there's lots of compensation being ordered to, to victims of the abuse of elders within the organization. And this really spoke to this man and said, this is a corrupt organization. And I'm sure those of you who are listening to me could maybe identify uh, with a similar happenings in other large religious institutions. But against that, as well as the corruption of that, he also said, I've been reading the Bible and I've been reading things that you've shared with me. And the Bible teaches quite clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ was God, manifest in the flesh. And he says, the witnesses have been teaching lies for decades. So all I would say is that I would encourage you to keep sharing uh, the truth uh, from uh, the scriptures with these people. And uh, as it says, you know, one man sows and another man waters. The Bible teaches clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ will visibly return one day. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, after the Lord has ascended, the disciples are still looking up into heaven and the angels appear and say, you know, men of Galilee, why are you still looking up? This same Jesus, who has been taken up from you, shall so return in like manner. The Lord Jesus Christ ascended visibly and he will return visibly. The witnesses believe that Jesus Christ will never again be seen on planet Earth. But our blessed hope is the appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I, if we have been born again, we are the true witnesses of the triune Jehovah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who dwells within us is a person. The Holy Spirit of the Jehovah's Witnesses is just an impersonal force, a bit like electricity. So they have a false Christ, they have a false Holy Spirit, and they have a false Father because according to them, he is the only God there are no other members in the Godhead. So I commend what we have shared here this morning and trust and pray that the Lord will bless it. And again, at the meeting uh, tomorrow morning in the church, God willing, I will have a, a handout or two on the Jehovah's Witnesses that will sort of flesh out some of the things that we have considered. So thank you for tuning in this morning. Again, as I say, it's our privilege to be with you down here in Limerick. And God willing, I'll see some of you in the flesh tomorrow morning. Thank you. Back to you, Keith. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate uh, just this ministry here this morning on Mormonism and the JWs. And um, we really pray, all of you listening here this morning, that the Lord does really stir your heart uh, to reach out and to win these individuals for Christ. They really need us to love their souls enough to speak the truth to them and even the apostle john speaking in in 1 john 4 and 6 he says and he is speaking as, as an apostle of god giving us the inspired scripture he says we are of god there's a way you can tell a preacher or a messenger is from god it says he that knoweth god heareth us and he that is not of god heareth not us hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error and this is the great test is the written scriptures the word of god that we have been given and that is the great test of every teaching of every group of every messenger of every religious institution let's hold fast to the written word of god and it's by means of the preaching of the word that we're gonna uh, reach souls for jesus christ and we do pray um, here this morning that if anyone involved in these organizations finds these messages online we are praying for you we are here to help you to answer your questions we can put you in touch with Cecil he can answer further questions and as a church here in Limerick 
we, we are here to love you, to show you the word of God. You, you will be able to choose and decide for yourself, but we will preach and, and show you what the written scriptures say and what the apostles of Jesus Christ said. And if any man does not teach what the apostles of Christ taught, then he is not of God. He's not sent from God and it is not a true gospel. So God bless you as you meditate in these things. We pray that you'll have a love for the word of God and having a love for the word of God is a thing we receive from God himself. And anyone who doesn't receive a love for the written scriptures, they'll be given over to deception. God bless you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.